about New Year's resolutions. And I went pretty quickly through the information. Again, if you want the notes, I can give it to you. Um, and I, I tried to cover as many points as I could because I believe that there is value in setting goals for yourself. You will never really progress and develop unless you're proactive and deliberate about it. Our default position is not one of growth. Does that make sense? Our human inclinations and wiring, if left to our own devices, will kind of lead us in the wrong direction. We'll stray, we'll wander. If you want to develop in your faith, there has to be a commitment to that thing. And there has to be a bit of strategy to say, okay, Lord, in what areas are you calling me to grow? I would challenge you to pray, Lord, what areas do you want to see changed in me? I promise you, somehow, some way, the Lord is going to make it very clear what he would like to see develop. Does that make sense? Can anybody relate to that experience at all? Lord, show me. If we are going to have resolutions, why not make them biblical? Please turn to the book of Matthew. And we're going to just stay here for a little while. Matthew 22. I want to begin at verse 37. I want to read two or so verses. As you turn, I want to welcome those who are joining us online. It's a privilege to have you. Wherever you're watching from, may the Lord bless you and yours as we enter into this new year. Matthew 22 should sound relatively familiar. Beginning at verse 37 and in context, the Lord is dealing with a question that was posed to him, namely, what is the most important commandment that the Lord has given us? And Jesus takes the time to answer that. And he says... Verse 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, if you can major on these two major things, if you set yourself to loving God and loving others to the degree that you love yourself, most things, if not all things, are going to naturally fall into place. How many of you want a healthy marital relationship? Good, three of you, excellent. Love God and love your wife or your husband. How many of you want wonderfully functional and life-giving relationships in general, friendships? Love God and love others. How many of you want to have a good experience at work in your place of employment? You want to be drama-free and you want it just to be smooth and to go well. Love God. Noticing a pattern here yet? Love others. If you want change in your life, this is the place to start. Whatever, whatever road you might take, it'll somehow be grounded in this. And we spent our time last week looking at six or seven ways that we can practically come to love the Lord even more. I want to focus this morning, however, on ways that we can become more loving to one another. Again, we have the first commandment, love God a little bit, right? No. With every fiber of your being, love him. But the second commandment, rather than being vertical, is horizontal. Love others to the degree that you love yourself. Love others as you love yourself. So what I want to note here is that in so many ways, our obligation to the Lord is not just to him, but it's to those that he has also made. I want to read this to you. In many ways, the measure of your faith is not your theological expertise, your volume in worship, the number of hours you spend in prayer, or the number of Bible verses that you memorize. How often and how frequently you attend church, how punctual you are, I'll throw that in, how much you give, what ministries you lead and or participate in. Those things are all good in their place. But the measure of your faith in so many respects is how you love each other and how you love those beyond our four walls. I want to show you a couple of Bible verses. Please turn, I would say, to Matthew 25. I'm going to get there in a moment. As you turn, I want to share this one with you. We are called as the church to love one another. My mom has a good line. Charity begins in the home. It doesn't end there, but it begins somewhere. There's a point of origin. To what degree do you love the people sitting in the same room as you right now? Don't answer that, but think about it. Are you at odds with somebody here? Someone done you wrong? I don't know. 
Church is split all the time, so don't tell me it doesn't happen. People don't play well in the sandbox. Ann didn't say hi to me this morning. Bobby walked right by me and didn't even know. Oh, all that stuff is petty. We got to learn how to love each other here. A new command I give you, says Jesus, love one another. It, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love each other. You think the world really cares about your theological statements if you treat your neighbor here badly? No, they don't. Rubber meets the road Christianity. Start here. Start in your own home. I want to look at Matthew 25, though. Because what we see here is a lengthy call for us as the church, those who follow the Lord, to love the downtrodden. I love that word, love the downtrodden. It's a lengthy text. Read with me beginning at verse 31. The Lord is, is forecasting something that is to come. Verse 31 of Matthew 25, we could spend the whole day here. I'm going to spend a few moments here. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he's going to have a fantastic entourage, by the way. He will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put his sheep on his right. Everybody in this half of the room this morning, you're on the good side. However, the goats on the left. No offense, Hefe. Then the king will say to those on his right, come. You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, verse 35. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me, and I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Isn't it interesting? That Jesus does not say in this context, blessed are those who place their faith in me. We know that we are saved by grace through faith, correct? But the evidence that our faith is real and genuine at all is what takes place that follows. What does James say? Faith without corresponding works is... So he looks at those on the right. Your faith in me was made manifest by the love and the concern that you had for each other and for those who were the least. And that they're going to look at him. The righteous will answer, verse 37, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we, when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or, or needing clothes and clothe you? When were you sick, Lord, and when were you were in prison that we went to visit you? And the, the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. So again, as Christians, as men and women of God, regardless of where you are in your walk, you can't tell me that how we treat each other is insignificant, and not just in this room and beyond. Are there sick in your world? Are there poor in your world? Are there people who are hungry around you? Are there practical ways that you can help? Because those practical evidences of your faith is really what shows that your faith is real is anybody can talk a good game. If the Church of America is good at anything, it's talking a big game. In the words of Ken Foley, who is at home recovering and doing well, don't tell me, show me. Let's show the Lord something. Let's have a love for each other. Let's have a love for those who are broken out there. How about this one? Jesus speaking, Matthew 5, don't turn there, but write the reference down. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How many of you, don't raise a hand, have enemies? Maybe people that don't get along with you all that well. If you're young, maybe it's someone in school that's always busting you, spreading rumors about you, lying about you, taking stuff out of your locker, moving, moving things, whatever it might be. If you're older, maybe it's that coworker or that boss. Everybody has that boss except for those of you who actually are bosses. <laughs> Lord bless you too. But we have people in our world that get under our skin, drive us nuts, and sometimes they really are intent on causing some harm. And our inclination as a human is to do them wrong. Ever hear the old song? I can recall my grandmother playing it. Somebody done me wrong song. It's easy. But what is Jesus saying? If you're going to call yourself mine, oh, I'm expecting something way different from you. He says things like love your enemies and pray for those who, 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 who malign you. In the book of Romans calls us to serve our enemies and to feed them and clothe them. So again, love in so many ways for everyone without exception is our calling. 
Is it a high calling? Everybody say, yeah. But is there a biblical way around it? No. If you're going to be a Christian long term, we have to learn to love each other. So let's get practical for a moment, because a lot of times pastors will tell you to do things and not tell you how to do them. So I'm going to spend some time giving you some hows. And these are going to sound remarkably familiar to the points of last week. Number one, let us resolve to know each other. I called you last week to know the Lord. That in 2018, you were going to have a resolution that you were going to establish and invest in your personal connection with the Lord. You were going to abide in him. You were going to cultivate that, that connection that you have with him. I am now calling you to do that with those who were in your world. Now, there are many, and I'm speaking to some of you, and honestly, you're a mystery to me. You prefer to live in isolation. You're happy to come to a church service. You're happy to keep some surface level communication. How's the weather? Bobby, how's work going? Have a nice shirt, man. You're looking really good. Don't push that one too far. Byron, good to see you. Shake a hand at the door. I'm always picking them. Hefe, you really are the best. Lord bless you. But you're happy to have a surface level conversation. But that's where you want it to end. Because you really don't want anybody to get any closer. Because they might come to see you and know you. And they might kind of see and know the things that you don't like about yourself. For reasons beyond the scope of our time, we have to recognize that man was not created to live in isolation. We just weren't. Let me share with you a verse from Genesis. Don't turn there, but Genesis 2 says the following. The Lord speaking shortly following the creation of man. It is not good for man to be alone. Therefore, I will make a helper for him, a helper suitable. We were formed to exist within the context of community. Guys, we were made for this. Not just listening to a pastor talk for a half an hour, but we were made to have relational connections, one with the other. And we see this through the entire word of God. When we think of Moses, in my mind, I think of a young Joshua who is following him. And I think of a fatherly Jephro. And I think of men like Aaron and Hur who were there to support him in the midst of difficult times. When I think of David, I can't help but think of Jonathan in the friendship that they had. When I think about Paul, I think of Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Titus and so many others that he called by name in his letters. In all of these cases, these great heroes of the faith that we should aspire to be like, right? They existed in the form of a community. And no one went it alone. And they excelled accordingly. Please turn to the Gospel of Mark. Book of Mark, chapter 3, because I want to show you that even Jesus lived in the context of said community. If anybody could have went it alone, it was Jesus. But even Jesus chose to surround himself with people. So if you're a loner in the sound of my voice, you don't want to let anybody in. Let me lovingly say there's a better way. Mark 3 beginning at verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside. This is after prayer, by the way. And called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. I want you to imagine he's surrounded by hundreds of people. And out of those hundreds, he begins to handpick Dakota, follow me. Not really. I'm in the story. Ray, follow me. Byron. Want you come. Not that he was excluding everybody else, but he really was kind of handpicking the people who were going to be in his inner sphere of influence and circle. Why? Verse 14, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. We always think of the apostles as those who were called out to preach, but that mission was born out of the fact that Jesus wanted them to be with him. The relationship with Jesus drove the ministry. That community of faith drove what they did later on. And then it gives the name of those Simon, Peter, and such, and there, there's 12 of them that are listed. This text identifies 12 people who were called to be apostles, 12 people who were eventually called to perform great and mighty things, but 12 people who were called by the Lord to be his inner band, his community, people that Jesus was willing to invest in, in people that the Lord was willing to be vulnerable with. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in a very broken moment, what did Jesus say? Boys, come here. 
he knew what was coming, but he's not fully revealing it to them. And I'm paraphrasing, but guys, we get some tough times. It's, will you pray with me? Of course, that went south. They all fell asleep and other things happened. But in his broken moments, Jesus, he wanted people around. Who are you investing in? Don't answer. We see in the ministry of Jesus, he was investing in these people. Many, 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 many hours over the course of many days and weeks and months and several years. Pouring into them. Who are you pouring into? If you have been a Christian for 20 years or more, you really at this point ought to be feeding others. And you ought to be helping people grow in their faith. And you ought to have someone under their wing, under your wing. If you have a ministry role, Patty, I'm looking at you, which you excel in. I'm thinking of Ron. I'm thinking of even Anne with a missions coordinator. I'm thinking of other people who are involved in ministry. Do you have right and left arms that you can work with? Are there people that you're pouring into? Are there, are there those that you're inviting in and saying, let me kind of show you a little bit about what this looks like? And are there people that you're vulnerable with? Are there people that you can pull the mask off and say, you know, I could really use some prayer because this is just bad. Jesus had that. Pray with me. To what degree are you cultivating these relationships? Are you seeking to truly know people? It's worth thinking of. Point number two out of the seven, I'll probably cover three or four. Let's resolve, just say ouch now, to trust one another. This is the outflow of the last point. Let us determine to place a degree of confidence in those around us. Now, I recognize that this is a very challenging point, and I want to just say two things briefly as we enter in. There are those who trust everyone. This type of living invariably brings harm because there are many people that are simply not worthy of the trust that you place in them. A universal level of trust violates scripture, and it requires wisdom on the part of such person. If you're the kind of person, you're a sweet little Pollyanna, you trust everybody equally, please stop. Have a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of sense. Let the Lord kind of put people in your life that you can, pour, that you can rely upon and such. But there are more people who trust no one. Very few people in my experience are totally trusting souls, at least for long. But there are many people, even here today, you truly don't really trust anybody, even your husband or your wife. Even though you're married and you've said, I do, there's still parts of you, you just guard that thing. Because you've been burned in disappointment and let down by so many people, you make the resolution to trust no one ever again. I'm not trusting anyone. I'm not letting anybody in because it always goes south. This is also a tragic decision because it violates God's word. We were made, per the last point, to live in community. And any meaningful relationship is going to re require trust. People who live this way typically live very lonely lives, and they rob others, and they rob themselves, which is sad. I want to read to you a selection of verses. Don't, you can just write them down. Don't turn to each of these. These are all from the Apostle Paul, who was willing to place his trust, willing to be vulnerable, willing to be open, willing to rely upon other people in the execution of his ministry. Again, I think of Paul, I think of someone who's so strong, who's so capable, but we see this strong and capable man operating in a place of trust, not just with the Lord, but with others. Hear his heart, Colossians 4. Devote yourselves to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Ephesians 6. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should, he says. 2 Thessalonians 3, as for other matters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may, may spread rapidly and be honored, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. And finally, Romans 15, pray that I may be kept safe from unbelievers, and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem, some money he was carrying, may be favorably received by the Lord's people there, so that I may come to you with joy and in your company, be refreshed. What do we see Paul here doing? 
guys, I'm in this thing, but I'm not in it alone. I need you. I can imagine the passion as he's writing, the sense of urgency as he's writing. I'm only going to be able to execute the calling and the assignment that God has given me if you will pledge to rally behind this thing and me in prayer. You know what that is? That's trust. He's saying, I trust you enough to ask, to rely upon, to be vulnerable, and to invite you in. Guys, if you want a resolution in 2018, try that one on. I said it yesterday to the men. We come to a church service on Sunday. You're all, you all look beautiful. You all look sharp. But probably a third of us, a third of us are faking it. Broken, miserable, unhappy, sad stuff going on. You want to know who you're really connected to? Who can you call at 2 in the morning without even thinking about it if there's a crisis? Whose number do you have on speed dial that you can call and you know that they'll pick up and you can be broken and they won't judge you, look down upon you, etc. But they'll say, I'm going to come alongside of that and I'm going to help you. This church is fantastic in this arena, by the way. I commend you for that. But for those of you who are like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go anywhere near that, try it. Be pleasantly surprised. If you watch the Animal Planet and those types of TV shows, what's the animal that typically gets picked off by the lion? Is it the one safely surrounded by peers or is it one that gets alone? If you're alone right now, by your choice, make a better one. Learn to trust. I'm going to move on in my notes because I'm running extremely low on time. Let's do this one. You ready? Let us resolve point number three in the new year to serve one another. I have a whole message at the ready or a series that the Lord hasn't given me a green light on, but it's called Christian four-letter words. And one of those four-letter words, meaning a negative term, is the word serve. I know there's five. Don't say I'm wrong. But the word four-letter term has a negative connotation. We say things like pray, and we're like, oh, we have to pray. As Pastor Bob Wise said, if, if he was hosting a dinner for the pastors, it would have been packed. But it was a prayer meeting, so no one was there. Serve. Let's serve one another. If you're married, and I were to ask your spouse, to what degree do they, do they, do they serve? What might your spouse say? I might have to have some of these conversations, by the way. Can you imagine? In the old days, a couple centuries ago, pastors used to, used to go house to house and talk to the parents about the training of their children and quiz the children and quiz the parents. We gotta bring some of these things back. Good, there's one of you out there and the rest kinda are nervously laughing, looking around who else is laughing with me. But when you, if I were to ask your spouse, to what degree do they serve? Are they useful? Are they profitable? Well, they're pretty lazy. Always on the couch. I have to do all the work. That, is that the kind of report you want to have? What about your kids? If I were to ask, oh, this could be fun. If I were to ask the little ones, tell me about mommy or daddy. What would they say? Again, no one's perfect. I get that. Don't feel overly bad, those of you who always feel bad about everything. It's those that never feel bad I'm talking to. There's always two kinds of people in ministry. I am called, biblically in some senses, to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. So depending on which you are, let's keep going. What would your parents say about you? If I were to interview, what might they say? I give you full permission to ask Ken and Betty what they think about their son. I mean that. I would never do this up here if I wasn't confident in the report that they would have to give. Or I wouldn't even preach about this point in the first place. What about your church family? If I were to ask your church family, what do you think? Do they serve? Are they known to be servants? What about your friends? What about your mentors? What about your protégés if you have them? What about your boss? What about your employees? What about those you stand alongside? What about your enemies? Do you have a reputation for being a servant? I love the example, and I want you to turn there in the book of John. This will be among the final verses, if not the final verse. John 13, because I, I've, I've chosen this passage, number one, because it's a beautiful illustration of what I'm speaking of, 
But as Christians, we are called to be like Christ. And we're going to see Christ set forth an example that is timeless and timely. Regarding the area of Christian service, John 13, it's the final evening of his life. He's spending time with his inner circle, the 12 that he chose several years earlier. And it begins at verse 1 in chapter 13 of John. It was just before the Passover, Passover festival. If you don't know what Passover is, come to Ginger's class in a few weeks and we can go. And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Let me just say, if I knew that tomorrow I was dying a horrible death, the odds of me saying, let me make this all about you, pretty small. I'm going to have what I want for dinner. I'm going to do what I want to do because we're all pretty selfish, right? But look at what Jesus says. Knowing that he was about to die, he begins to make some incredible decisions. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto or to the end. Verse 2, the evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompt, prompted the traitor Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray the Lord. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After, after that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the feet of many smelly men. That's my paraphrase. Not a glorious job. It was the job of a household servant or slave. And I love that Jesus was willing to do that, by the way, because he knew who he was in the Lord. He knew that all things were under his feet. That's why he didn't have to lord it over people. There are bosses out there that are continually reminding, them who, reminding the employees who's in charge because they're insecure in the position that they hold. Pastors who lord it over their people, don't you forget who runs this place? get to work. That's not what he's doing. Because I know who I am, he's saying. I'm going to serve you. And I'm going to set forth an example. It says, he began to wash their feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Skip down to verse 12, because this is where it becomes applicable to us. When he had finished washing their feet, and we don't know how long that took, a few moments, a few minutes, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. And I would say he's also asking us. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, here's the rub. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Truly, very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be what? You will be blessed if you do them. Sometimes in Christianity, I'm going to pretty much end with this point nearly. There are some things that we have to deal with that are messy. I can recall being in Bible school. I won't share the fellow student's name but he's a minister out there somewhere, and he's a, he's a man of God. And we're in the restroom, and I'll keep this somewhat clean. And there was a major backup, and the bathroom was disgusting. Can you get a mental image of what I'm referring to? I want to be appropriate for those who are watching online. He was an RA, meaning he was, you know, one of the students helping to run the dorm. And I was just there, because I walked by, and I saw this poor kid in the midst of a not his own crisis, but a, a plumbing pr crisis. And we're looking at a disgusting situation, and I mean, it was gross. And he looks over at me, he says, what do you think I should do? I said, what would Jesus do? I was so spiritual back then. <laughs> and and we, clean, we clean the thing. It's gross. Bathrooms are gross, let's be honest. Why? Because we were called to serve. Yeah, he helped to run the place. Did that free him from the obligation to serve, or did that give him more of a reason to serve? It's more of a reason. People are messy too, by the way. Get involved in their drama and their problems. Deal with people. We're all kind of messes in our own. We're all sheep, and sometimes they bite. 
Getting involved in people, it's messy work. Serving people, it's messy work. Yeah, I know it's easy to hide out with your own two or three people that you like, but if you want to be a Christian for real, you have to get out there and get to work at times, and it's messy. But what is Jesus saying? If I did it, what's your excuse? I'm the guy that runs the show, and I'm willing to do it. You are a servant. Get to work. But Lord, it's gross, yeah? So are you. Deal with it. We need, we need to reorient to these things, is what I'm trying to say to you. So wherever you are in your life, to what degree are you serving people? Make it a resolution to serve. And final, I will end with this sincerely. Now and then, make it a resolution, have a goal of trying to enjoy each other. I ended last week with the same point, enjoying the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength, walking around always angry and sad looking. Your heart says you're celebrating, but your face doesn't, hasn't got the memo yet. It's the same thing with us. People can be a source of pain and drama. Yeah, I get it. After almost 15 years in this field, yeah, people can be, can, can be tough. I get that. Including me, by the way. But they can be a source of incredible joy. How many of you have kids? Raise a hand. Young or old. Because the principle is true no matter what. How many of you, there are times your kids drive you nuts? Little ones, teenagers, 20-somethings, 50-year-olds. They just... Huh, I brought him into this world, I might just take him out, as Bill Cosby used to say. How many people in the sound of my voice, despite the pain and afflictions, you love your kids and they're a source of incredible joy and you wouldn't undo it for the world? Yeah. I have never had a human relationship that was 100% easy, ever. Misty is the, one of the greatest humans uh, I've ever met. She's work, as am I. But the joys and the reward of connection and fellowship far outweighs them all. I look around the room, I see people, we've clashed at times, behind the scenes at times. We've had genuine disagreements, even ones that were healthy and good. But I value you as friends, and more than that, family. And I mean that sincerely. The joys of connection in prioritizing people and having elements where you trust people and let them in, it's worth it. I don't have the time to enumerate the benefits, but I think of the Apostle Paul's line, and I mean this for you, and I pray you mean it for each, of each other. Philippians 1, I thank my God every time I remember you. You pop into my head, and it happens all the time as pastor. I carry you with me wherever, wherever I go, I mean that. People say I'm the highest paid hourly employee that they know, because I work one hour a week. It never stops. You're always in my head somewhere. And so often when you pop in, I smile. Because even if you're struggling or you're hurting, I can rejoice over how you're doing it and the progress that you're making and the effort that you're showing. There's always something good. So many points I skipped. If you want the notes, feel free to ask. But if we are going to love the Lord, which he has called us to do fully, a large part of that is going to automatically spill over in how we love each other. So as we go forth from this place, I don't know what resonates with you, what's, what stands out to you, which of the four or so points really the Lord's saying, this is something that I want to address with you. You don't need a fancy ending to a service. Go forth and do the thing. Put it into practice. And if you need any help or coaching or instruction or a sounding board, I'm always available. There's a wonderful team of deacons here as well and a board. Avail yourself of the ministry leaders and beyond. Let's close in prayer. Father, this has been a bit of a spiritual meal. There's been so much information given, and we can all only digest, in a sense, so much at once. But with whatever has been shared, God, I pray that you would bring about change in us, change that would honor and glorify you. Lord, that you would refine us and perfect us and purify us and, and chop off things that need to be removed and install within us things that we desperately need. Grant us the strength and the desire to serve you. As we go our separate ways, continue to add your favor and your blessing as we love you and one another. In Jesus Christ's name, everyone says amen.